So birthdays are way more interesting than you think. Did you know your own mother probably wouldn't have acknowledged your birthday until like 200 years ago? Even though calendars have been around for over 5,000 years? Also, how many people do you think there need to be in a room in order to practically guarantee a 99% chance or higher that at least two of them will have the same birthday? My guess was like twice as high as the real answer, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My name is Jordan, I'm an artist and a curious person, and today we're gonna talk about birthdays, we're gonna talk about history, we're gonna talk about sociology, we're gonna talk about pop culture, we're gonna talk about statistics, and I promise you it's gonna be interesting. While we chat about all this fascinating birthday stuff, I'm going to design and paint some playing card themed birthday card art with acrylic ink and acrylic wash. First, some history of birthdays in the West. The modern prevailing idea of birthdays, the cake, party, song, birthday cards, gifts, all that stuff, is a very Western concept that developed and then spread mostly via colonialism and industrialization. There are some really interesting traditions around similar personal celebration and aging concepts in non-Western cultures, like the 100th day celebration in Korean culture and the entire population aging up on New Year's Day in a lot of East Asian cultures. But this video's research and pre-production process has already taken about four or five times longer than I anticipated, so I'm also just trying to narrow down the scope. It's very weird to my modern brain to only have a vague estimate of how old you are, but people didn't always know. I'm not talking about plus or minus a few days either, I'm talking about not being sure what year you were born. I guess I assumed if there was a way to reference a calendar, you would do so for a birth. The only dates worth noting for a lot of history were religious observances and festivals, and your local priest or equivalent would be the one calculating when those were supposed to happen and letting you know about it. So most people didn't really know or care what the date was on just a random day for kind of a long time. In retrospect, I guess this makes sense. Maybe I just hadn't really thought about it too much. Like why would an illiterate farmer in the fifth century care if it's January 8th or 12th? It's just the middle of winter. On the other hand, having a baby feels like it would be a, a notable event regardless of era or location and even if it's your sixth time doing it. But for a lot of history, if any birthdays were recognized, it would be leaders or other very important people. So how do we get here? In the late Roman Republic, there were three types of quote unquote birthdays recognized. That's right guys, it is time to think about the Roman Empire. First, celebrations for the births of cities and temples, what we would probably now call an anniversary. The public would also celebrate both the actual birthdays of and the accession days of emperors and their families. The ancient Egyptians were doing a similar thing before this, by the way, where there were celebrations of pharaohs who were reborn into gods when they were crowned. However, Romans were a little bit different because they celebrated their own birthdays and those of their friends and families as well. And we can thank them for bringing cake to the party too. They had this cultural idea of a personal genius, which is kind of like a guardian angel in concept, but one that also dictates your personality. And yes, that's the root of the way that we use genius today. We just jumped from a spirit having given you the talent to it being some innate part of you. Okay, so the Romans would have celebrations on their birthdays, which are conveniently also the genius's birthday, to thank their genius for another year of life. As part of the celebration, you would offer your genius cake, wine, and incense at the family altar and wish for another year of protection. Incense is kind of candle-like, but there are a few theories as to where candles properly enter the birthday scene, so uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Birthdays get reeled back a little bit when Catholicism enters the picture because this whole personal celebration thing feels too prideful and pagan to them, but a related concept evolves. So often parents were pulling their children's baptismal names, which is also the name you'd be primarily known as, from a calendar of saints. If a child survived past infancy, you would begin celebrating their saints' days. So now we have a more Catholic version of celebrating this connection between a person, a spiritual figure, and the date. And so the birthday party lives on. Over time, saints' days morph into name days, which are still around today in a lot of countries in Europe and the Americas with Catholic history and traditions. What the name of the day is for any given date will vary from country to country, uh, even if the name kind of translates between languages. And there are also some countries that have name day concepts that are separate from the Catholic tradition. 
After the Renaissance, the Protestant Revolution made saints' days less universally recognized. By the 16th century, childhood had started to be recognized as a special, formative time in someone's life. The printing press made calendars more widely available. Uh, even so, your numerical age and date of birth wasn't really important to everyday life for early modern European societies. As early as the 15th century, German bakeries were selling birthday cakes, and by the 17th century, they were much more elaborate, more like what we have today, multiple layers and decorations. These were luxury items only for the wealthy. Uh, everyday people weren't really having birthday cakes yet. There's some debate about where birthday candles come from. Uh, there was a lot more on this topic from like listicles and blog posts and not so much in the more academically rigorous stuff I was reading on like JSTOR. Uh, one of the top search results for this question was from Pump It Up's website, which is a chain of inflatable indoor playground kind of things that host uh, a lot of children's birthday parties. So with that pinch of salt, let's talk about it. I lean more towards the theory that this was started by the Germans. As we've discussed, they have had a long birthday cake uh, tradition, and they also sure love to put a candle on stuff. Um, we also have them to thank for uh, Christmas lights, like putting lights on your Christmas tree. It used to be candles. It's a German fire hazard. At least cake isn't nearly as flammable as a dead tree. Anyway, adding candles to the cake was part of Kinderfest, which celebrated children's birthdays. A cake would be topped with candles corresponding to the child's age plus one, which represented the hope for another year to come. Unlike modern birthday celebrations, though, the candles were lit in the morning and kept lit until after dinner, at which point the child would try to blow them all out. Uh, sounds like a big pile of wax. The other major theory is that ancient Greeks started the birthday candle tradition, and of course this would have been much earlier than the Germans. An offering of round cakes surrounded by candles were common to honor Artemis, goddess of the moon and fertility, with the idea being that the glow of the candles on the cake make it look like the moon, which is delightful. My unprofessional opinion is that I don't doubt that this was a thing, but it kind of feels like a coincidence. Candles and special foods are common in celebrations, so it doesn't feel that far out there that this could happen multiple times. And the fertility goddess festival versus celebration of individual human birthdays feel only adjacent to each other conceptually. If we did candles on cakes for baby showers, I think maybe that would feel more connected to me. Stuff I read about both the German and the Greek histories sometimes reference the idea that the smoke from blown out candles uh, was a carrier of the birthday wish up to the heavens, so uh, there's that too. Let's pick back up where we left off in the 1800s, where we really start to see birthdays as we know them take shape. Birthdays start to be celebrated more regularly by the middle class, but according to one of the academic papers I read on this topic, titled It's About Time, Birthdays as Modern Rites of Temporality, uh, the details are pretty fuzzy because people didn't write about birthday celebrations as something new or trendy. They wrote about it as though it was already conventional. By the 1860s, written references about birthdays transitioned from being mostly about public figures to mostly about private or family celebrations. By the 1870s, middle-class Americans were commonly celebrating birthdays. Birthday cards started popping up in the late 19th century, and it wasn't long before they started including jokes about getting old. There are some big cultural shifts that happen at this time that contribute to the modern birthday. One of these big cultural shifts is in attitudes towards children, the Victorian idea of a quote-unquote sentimental childhood. Middle-class people describe increasingly emotional and familial reasons for having children, and family life centers around them. Mortality rates for children under five begin to drop. Families also started having fewer kids, meaning increased attention and budget per kid. An emphasis on children's birthdays had already been established with the Kinderfest roots, and so celebrating birthdays became expected as part of a normal and cha chappy childhood. <laughs> a normal and happy childhood. Also, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing, which means a lot of different things. Firstly, the birth of consumerism and advertising as we know it. That's a whole other rabbit hole that would be very interesting to go down, but we'll just leave it at that very simplified statement for now. Mass production means cheaper goods and people just more commonly had disposable income to spend on things like parties and cake. Secondly, this is kind of a nebulous, weird thing to talk about, but the Industrial Revolution changed people's relationship to time and precision. 
This is when people started carrying pocket watches. Factory workers needed to show up at a specific time. We have engines, we have trains, and now because we have trains, we have time zones. We've moved way beyond you might own a calendar and the church bell rings once a day to, as Flavor Flav would say, you know what time it is. This is when the terms on time, ahead of time, and behind time started being used to talk about daily life, like showing up to work, for example, but also about your progress through life. So now people have the means and maybe a stronger psychological desire to record time and date of birth, as well as track your milestones in life against your age and other people who are your age. Industrialization also means urbanization, which leads to larger schools. Larger schools would have more reason to divide children by age versus a one-room schoolhouse kind of situation. Medical assessments also begin to use age to check against developmental milestones. I found a handful of laws from this era, or even earlier, that centered around age. These were similar types to things that we have now, like minimum ages for voting, consent, purchasing alcohol, stuff like that. But it would have been just very easy to get away with lying about your age, because people didn't typically have IDs. From what I can tell, it was kind of a thing for soldiers and international travelers. I resisted the urge to get too deep into the history of identification rabbit hole, though. The United States didn't begin issuing birth certificates until 1907. Prior to that, you would have some town or family records, but if there was a flood or fire, decades worth of information could have been wiped out. Once birth certificates started being issued, you could request one retroactively. Specifically, this would have been an issue for social security applications when that program began in 1935. But again, you might not know your birthday. Let's say you're born on a farm in 1895. Now it's 40 years later and you're trying to register your social security number. You don't have any direct evidence of your birth, so you'd get someone to testify. Maybe a parent if they're still alive, or your sibling, or uh, your neighbor that you grew up next to. Of course, they probably don't really know either, so you're just making up a date based on what they remember. Like, uh, it was a few weeks before Christmas, or, you know, when that big rainstorm happened. Up until very recently, like just a few generations ago, my grandparents' grandparents, people's ages could be much fuzzier than what would be acceptable today. I'm sure people researching their genealogies have a great time with this. For much of birthday history, birthday parties were an intimate home gathering. Just your family, maybe some other folks in your very inner circle. Children's birthday parties started being held outside the home in the late 1970s and early 80s. McDonald's, museums, and clubs started offering birthday parties as a service. Chuck E. Cheese, Showbiz Pizza Place, and the like start popping up. Personally, I had several of my birthday parties growing up at a place called Plaster Fun House, where everyone got to pick a plaster figurine or wall art thing or like piggy bank and paint it. Then I remember they would spray it with a glossy sealant and throw some glitter in there on request. I'm sure to all of the parents' absolute delight. This is honestly still a pretty solid birthday activity for me. Uh, let's get everyone together. We're all gonna sit and focus on our own quiet creative projects. Parallel play is underrated. Since birthday celebrations have been a cultural norm across multiple classes and countries for generations, it's no surprise they make regular appearances as storytelling devices, especially in children's media. Birthday gifts and birthday parties are often used to demonstrate relationships between characters and their friends and families. One of the tropes or recurring themes you might notice is a character who's never had a birthday. This is seen as something to be corrected, and usually the plot follows the character's friends as they put together a birthday celebration. There's an episode in the first season of Steven Universe about this, where Steven puts on a birthday party for each of the Crystal Gems, who are supernatural beings who weren't born and thus have had no birthdays. On Community, Donald Glover's character Troy grew up a Jehovah's Witness, a faith that forbids birthday celebrations. When they realize it's his 21st birthday, his friends plan a party and get him a very uh, hilarious and, as they say, religiously respectful cake. Never Had a Birthday is also the tragic backstory of Chuck E. Cheese. Apparently, Mr. Charles Entertainment Cheese is an orphan rat who has never known his birthday, so he makes up for it by throwing birthday parties. Similarly, a solo birthday party, on purpose or not, is also seen as a tragedy. It's either unintentional and indicates the true loneliness of the character, nobody remembered and or nobody is nearby enough to physically be with them. Or, less commonly, it's intentional and shorthand for antisocial behavior. 
The first few chapters of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone center around the contrast between Dudley's lavish birthday and Harry's cupboard lifestyle. On Harry's 11th birthday, everything changes. This is the big door gets banged down, Hagrid says you're a wizard Harry moment. Harry's birthday is pretty much how every book opens, although sometimes it's a mention more than a scene. And how his birthday goes that year is often kind of a tone setter for the rest of the book, showing loneliness and then how his relationships with other characters evolve. Sixteen Candles centers around a forgotten birthday, and this theme is also a mainstay of sitcoms. Full House, Malcolm in the Middle, That 70s Show, Family Matters, Drake and Josh, Hannah Montana, and I'm sure many others all have episodes where the main conflict is centered around a forgotten birthday. In the first season of Arrested Development, Michael arranges two surprise birthday dinners for his mother, Lucille. After none of the family shows up to the first dinner, all the siblings promise Michael they'll show up if he plans another one, and of course, nobody shows up to that one either. This is a story beat that helps establish Lucille's character because to most people, either forgetting about or willfully not attending your mom or grandmother's birthday party would be uh, indicative of a poor or non-existent relationship. If you're unfamiliar with the show, throughout the series, Lucille is frequently seen, one, saying critical and manipulative things to and about her children, and two, defending herself against accusations of being a bad mother. It's also an early example of the running theme of Michael trying and failing to wrangle his dysfunctional family into doing the quote-unquote right thing. Birthday Buddies is another birthday-related trope in fiction. If characters who aren't twins share a birthday, it's meaningful in some way. It might indicate some sort of cosmic relationship between the two, be a reason to bond or deepen a rivalry, or foreshadow a twin separated at birth twist. I do think people who share a birthday tend to make a note of this. Um, I remember someone I went to high school with, even though we weren't particularly close and haven't talked since, just because we have the same birthday. But in part, this trope works because it'd just be weird to bring up the fact that two characters have the same birthday for no reason. Sort of in the same way it would be weird to have two characters with the same first name, even though that's pretty common in real life. And actually, two people in a group sharing a birthday is also more common than you would think. There's a question in probability theory called the birthday problem, which asks for the probability that in a set of n randomly chosen people, two will have the same birthday. Note that this is different than someone else having the same birthday as you. So, how many people do you think there need to be in a group in order for there to be at least a 50% chance that two of them have the same birthday? I'll give you a few seconds to estimate an answer, but hit pause for a moment if you really want to work it out. The birthday problem is really notable because of the answer, which is referred to as the birthday paradox. The answer to the question I just posed, how many people do you need to make it more likely than not that that group will have two people who share a birthday, is 23. Both as a student and when I was teaching, almost all of my classes were at least 23 people, and it's very weird to think that in every class period, it was more likely than not that two of the students would have the same birthday. By the way, if a group has 57 people, it's almost certain there will be a match, over 99% probability. This answer feels incredibly unintuitive, thus the birthday paradox. The answer is unintuitive in part because it's really hard to approximate in your head, and even if you have strong mental math, a lot of people don't really have a strong grasp of statistics concepts, myself included. I didn't have a chance to estimate an answer, I saw it pretty much immediately when I saw the concept itself, um, but even if I sat down to work out this problem, I'm not sure if I would have gotten to 23. And I think I would have figured that that answer was wrong anyway, because it just feels too low. After you learn the math behind it, the answer does feel a little bit better. When you realize uh, 23 people in a group means there are 253 possible pairings, 253 possibilities out of 365 days is about 70% of the days covered. There's a whole Wikipedia page with all the math explained. Uh, it's listed on my sources. It goes in depth on the birthday problem and a lot of related problems, like the probability that you and another person in the room will have the same birthday. So if you want more math than I will ever, ever give you, run on over there after this and give them that $3 they're asking for while you're there. In reality, birthdays aren't evenly distributed throughout the year, so there's actually a slightly higher likelihood that two people will share a birthday than a lot of people would calculate for their birthday problem, where you would probably have the assumption that there's a 1 in 365 shot of being born on any given day. July through October is peak birthday season, with all 10 of the 10 most common birthdays in the US falling in September. 
So if you're watching this when it comes out, happy belated birthday, statistically speaking. September and October are thought to be popular birth months due to being nine months after the holiday season. Interestingly, it's specifically the holidays, not the fact that it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere, because the same pattern holds true in New Zealand, where the holidays fall in summer. Unsurprisingly, February 29th is the least common birthday. Christmas Day is the second least common birthday in the US, followed by New Year's Day and Christmas Eve, because C-sections and induced labor wouldn't be scheduled on those days. For similar reasons, more babies are born on Mondays and Tuesdays than the rest of the week. Pretty much nobody chooses to work on weekends, so no C-sections, no induced labor. Because of this, if you were considering the birthday problem for a group of people born within a year or two of each other, like a graduating class or a cohort of kids at a summer camp, there'd be an even higher likelihood of there being a match. There's a small decrease in births on Halloween, even for unscheduled births. There's a 5% decrease for spontaneous births and a 17% decrease for planned births. There's a small increase in both planned and spontaneous births on Valentine's Day a 3.5% increase in unplanned and a 12% increase in planned. I also looked a little into the birthday effect, which is pretty interesting, but before we get into it, I wanted to give a heads up that we're going to talk about death, including specific causes of death for a few minutes. If that's not something that feels right for you or someone who's listening with you right now, skip ahead. Chapters are marked on YouTube and I'll also have a timestamp here on the screen uh, so you move to a spot where you can jump back in. So the birthday effect is that people are more likely to die within a few days of their birthday. It's kind of debated as to whether this is really a real statistical phenomenon, but it's got some evidence behind it. I thought this was probably just something akin to the frequency illusion or the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, where you notice something more after noticing it initially. Usually people give the example of buying a specific kind of car and then you feel like you see that car everywhere all of a sudden. In this case, there's not many other reasons where birth and death dates would be noteworthy to you, especially in a way that's so immediately obvious. I think this bias still comes into play, but there are some studies that show there may actually be a statistical boost. It's not consistently shown and the effect is small, probably around a 7% increase in likelihood. Remember, that means if you start with a 1% chance, a 7% increase in probability would mean you now have a 1.07% chance, not an 8% chance. There are a few theories as to how this increase can be explained. Birthdays come with psychological stress. It's a time when people often think about aging or look back at their lives. Stress leads to more health emergencies like heart attack and stroke. Hey, have you uh, had a nice deep breath lately? And uh, when's the last time you stretched or had some water? Let's check it in. There's also the fact that it's just a notable date in your own mind in the same way that Christmas might be. Terminally ill patients may try to hang on a little longer with the hopes of reaching their next birthdays, for example. Uh, people celebrating their own birthdays are more likely to have increased alcohol and drug consumption and or just general foolishness. Looking at deaths within a week of the birthday, the causes of death related to alcohol were overrepresented in the 20 to 29 age group and on weekends with a 25% increase, more than three times the overall effect. Lastly, there's also the argument that the record keeping that the data came from to begin with is imperfect. Clerical errors like people processing death certificates incorrectly by reading the date of birth on the form as the date of death. Um, although this wouldn't explain why people are more likely to die around their birthday. There's also the fact that when a death date is not known, people are more likely to use the 1st or 15th as an approximation, meaning more deaths overall get recorded on those dates. So maybe a tiny boost there. On a much lighter note, cake. We've already looked at how long cake has been central to birthdays, but I also wanted to look into the modern birthday cake, especially because of how popular it has been as a flavor for the past decade, and especially in the past few years. There are birthday cake flavored vodkas, Oreos, candles, ice creams, lip balms, protein bars, breakfast cereal, collagen supplements, popcorn, the list goes on. I think it's really interesting that there's a unified idea of what flavor or scent birthday cake is supposed to be, even though in reality, people have all sorts of different cakes at their birthdays. Despite this, there's a consensus on what birthday cake is, a creamy or buttery vanilla flavor with rainbow sprinkles visible, if at all possible. Funfetti, essentially. 
Milk Bar's famous birthday cake, which by the way, I went to their website to see how much they cost. And I saw that you can subscribe to monthly cake delivery, which is now the lifestyle I aspire to. Anyway, Milk Bar's birthday cake is definitely fun fighting inspired and they describe it as nostalgically sweet, which I think perfectly encapsulates why that's the birthday cake flavor. Of course, it's not universally popular. I think it's kind of hit and miss depending on the product, usually too sweet for me. I read an article about the trend that had a tweet quoted from a baker and writer who said birthday cake flavor was, quote, the Axe body spray of food flavorings. I couldn't find good data on it, but I wonder if the birthday cake trend, which defined what flavor birthday cake should be, has affected the popularity of vanilla or funfetti flavors when it comes to actually buying or making cakes. When I did a Google search for birthday cake recipe, I got a mix of flavors, but most commonly either a funfetti cake with a vanilla buttercream or a yellow cake with chocolate buttercream, which I think was the more popular birthday cake prior to Funfetti coming out, which was 1989. But again, I couldn't really find solid data about this. I have another birthday party story that didn't really fit into any of my sections, but I liked it enough that I wanted to keep it in. Stephen Hawking had a birthday party as an experiment to disprove time travel. Long story short, he held a birthday party without telling anyone and then sent out invitations afterward. Nobody showed up to the party and therefore no time travelers, he says. This isn't a perfect experiment, of course. It's certainly possible that the invitation was just not received by any possible time travelers, but I think it's pretty compelling considering Stephen Hawking would be someone who folks developing time travel technology would likely uh, be at least aware of. It's a better experiment than if pretty much anyone else alive today were to try and do the same thing. At the end of every drawing attention, I like to give a little riddle or clue about the topic for the next episode. For example, last time I gave the clue, what do the Beatles, Katy Perry, and Destiny's Child all have in common? And they all have songs titled Birthday. Before I give you the clue though, uh, a couple quick things I want to mention. If you're someone who loves a good Snapple fact or Wikipedia rabbit hole, please consider subscribing. If you want to download the birthday card, there is a link in the description. Um, it is completely free for personal use, meaning you can uh, print it and give it to as many people as you would like. Uh, you can hang it on your wall if you want. I don't really care as long as you don't sell it. Um, I am not even asking you to sign up for a newsletter or anything, which is probably what I should be doing. So be cool. If you are interested in the original, or if you'd rather have me take care of the printing and envelope sourcing and all that stuff for the physical card, the link for that is also in the description. All right, are you ready for your clue? Feel free to post your guesses in the comments. Um, I will neither confirm nor deny though. Truman Capote, Charles Dickens, and Lord Byron are some of the greatest literary minds of all time, but what else do they have in common? 